So, we have the fact that they are getting a poor quality education in charge, on average. Now, that might be some good. I'm sure there are. But there might be some exceptions. But exceptions don't create good school systems. Critical mass creates good school systems. And this model does not come anywhere near to producing the critical mass of good schools needed to create a good system. Government has no business supporting a model for schooling where nine out of every 10 of the new schools can't even beat the average of the schools in existence. And again, this is not against charter educators. This ain't against parents who send your kids to charters. You need this information. Right? People out there trying to do their best, they're working with whatever information they have, they're trying to send their kids to where they believe they'll be safe, where they believe they'll get an education. I'm sure the teachers in those schools work just as hard. But there's something about that model that does not work. And we have to get to those things. That's important. Again, when I talk about poverty, we have to figure out what the levels are and talk about those levels. It's the same thing with charters. It can't be an anti-charter thing. We have to talk about what makes them, those things that make them toxic to our system, and get rid of those things. You get rid of those things, we won't have to worry about charters. The only people who want to engage in a charter are people who actually have good, who want our kids, who actually want to do the right thing about it. So, all one of the things I'm concerned about is that all charters don't are not toxic. There are some not real non-profit ones in Chicago that care. I've met with, with them, I've talked with them. Uh, and so I like to focus on these things, to say these things have to get addressed. These are five major problems with charters. And these are the things we have to talk about. One, there's a lack of oversight and transparency. You can't have another one until that gets fixed. There's a diversion of funds that incentivizes robbing funds from students, taking funds that could go to students so that folks can profit. The profit motive has to be removed. You know, this whole thing where the nonprofits get around the, the rule for having to be a nonprofit by hiring a for-profit company to manage it for them has to be eliminated. They're failing students through expulsions. That has to get dealt with. It has to end. The hyper-segregation, where not only are we segregated by race now, but within a race, we're separated by income. With the folks in extreme poverty concentrated in one school and the folks in moderate poverty in another. That must end. We, have, we cannot have enrollment systems like that. And this idea, and this, we have to look at the academic growth of students in charge. And unless that changes, there can't be another charter. And we have to start reintegrating charters into district management. I don't say close them. Again, you got to be careful with your language. Oh, I wouldn't close the school. But your school needs to be reintegrated into district management. <laughs> that charter company, that charter management company, we got to get rid of them and have, a, have an organization manage your school that doesn't have that profit motive to take resources away from your child. We have to put a compensation system in place at your school that will attract and retain good teachers. Because right now, the one you have, we have to reintegrate you in a district manager. Now, it's interesting, these four pillars that I found, because they look eerily similar to this. One of the things I love about what the NAACP did, they, didn't, they called for a moratorium on charters. But they did it with four specific conditions. You have to address these things. They said, we are calling for a moratorium on the expansion of the charter schools, at least until such time as charter schools are subject to the same transparency and accountability standards as public schools. Public funds are not diverted to charter schools at the expense of the public school system. Charter schools cease expelling students that public schools have a duty to educate and cease to perpetuate de facto segregation of the highest performing children from those whose aspirations may be high, but whose talents are not yet as obvious. 
That's what has to get emphasized in the debate. There's an alderman, there's an alderman in Chicago, his name is Rick Munoz, and I love his man. Uh, and when I met him for the first time, he said, you know, I don't have a problem with charters. If they want to come into my ward, I said, sure. I just give them two conditions. I say, number one, you have to allow your employees to bargain collectively for salary and working conditions. And number two, you have to take an attendance boundary. You don't get to cherry pick. You take, you get a boundary, and you take those kids and see what you can do with them. And he said, you know what? They never take me up on my offer. I don't know why. Right, but that's an example of someone who understands the power of language and how you frame your response to Charles. He went right toward the two most significant factors that make them toxic. You got this? Now, we have to see the connection of this movement to other movements against working people across this country. Right? <laughs> that the same forces that privatize, or the same strand of movement on the part of the wealthy that privatized Chicago's parking meters, <laughs> is the same strand that trying to privatize our school system with charters and vouchers. Right? There is a movement to extract public wealth from serving the public and to send that wealth to private hands. And if we don't see that connection, if we think our charters is the problem, they'll come up with a new way to extract wealth. We have to see that and we have to defeat it and I believe we will. We can and we will. So thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you very, very much.